Welcome to Massive Passive Cash Flow, the podcast that guides professionals to financial prosperity. Join our community and let's start building your wealth. Here's your host, Gary Wilson. Welcome back to the Massive Passive Cash Flow podcast. I'm Gary Wilson, your host, and I'm glad to have you back on the show listening. We got a great guest today, Brandon Cobb from Eastern Tennessee, well, for Tennessee, I'll just say Eastern Tennessee, but Tennessee, and uh, some great information for you. And he's a he's a he's a good citizen. Um, he does some good things for the community, particularly when it comes to veteran homelessness. So we're going to touch on that. I just want you guys to really listen, take it all in. If you're not driving, take notes. If you are driving, remember you can always, when you get home, find this online. You can go to the website and find it under our, our blog post. I'm sorry, podcast section under resources. Get all the show notes there. Okay, and uh, while you're doing that. Make sure you leave a review because <laughs> we your reviews are our currency. So, in any case, without further ado, Brandon, man, it's good to see you again, brother. Welcome, welcome to the show. I'm I'm looking forward to this. You know, David, it's great to see you again too. It's an honor. I appreciate you having me on. You you got it. So let, let's go ahead and uh, if you could give some people, give everybody some context, like you know. How did you get to where you are now? What was the like? What was the inspiration, or what was the? Sometimes life just unfolds. It's not like you had a big plan for this. It just ended up being the next logical step. But whatever it is, paint a picture for people, and then we can go into you know more particulars about what you're doing today and and uh, how they can participate. You know. Yeah, I'll give you the here and now, and then we'll have some fun reverse engineering it. So, you know, today I, I run and operate HBG Capital. We're a private real estate investment firm that primarily focuses on inventing new communities that are for first time home buyer housing. So we're in that, you know, that that affordable housing niche that everybody is talking about that that's a huge problem. And our market is Nashville, Tennessee. So we invent new communities to cater to that first time home buyer. But once upon a time, I was in medical device sales and Gary, I don't have this crazy story where I got sick of being in a corporate job and worked there for 20 years and said, Oh, you know, I just, I, I've, I've meant for something more. I need to go and start my own business. I actually love what I did. So young guy in his twenties, I got to wear scrubs every single day to work. I got to work in the OR. It's always an interesting day when you get to sit in on some surgeries. I got to rub shoulders with very, esteemed and successful orthopedic surgeons. I thought that was really cool. And most importantly, I got to train people on how to use my product and I got to make a difference in the patient's life. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. My products got to go in somebody and rehabilitate them. So I did sports medicine where if you had a rotator cuff tear or a labral tear or maybe an ACL tear, I sold anchors, sports medicine products allograph tissue and I basically made you better. And let me tell you, I absolutely loved my job. I would not have changed anything about it. And I'll never forget, there was one Friday afternoon around four o'clock, I was meeting my boss. I was coming from a Harry Hospital over near downtown Nashville. And man, I was excited. Mm -hmm. I was excited because I just had a phenomenal trial at a hospital. I also sold power equipment, drills and saws and stuff. So I got to sit in on a surgery and uh, long story short, the other sales rep I was going up against, like really just ticked the doctor off and it opened up a door for me to get even more business that I wasn't planning on. So I show up to this Starbucks over off Weston Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee, excited to give my boss the news. And let me tell you, like you could just smell the coffee as you're like rolling up. Everyone's like leaving for work and I'm about to give him the great news. And as I'm sitting down there pulling my chair up, he has a weird look on his face. And before I can even get out how awesome of a day I was having, he fires me. <laughs> and this was a huge shock. I had never been fired before. I was couldn't stop thinking about what did I do wrong? Like, what did this happen? I got this rookie of the year sales award. And what's going on? Like, why did this happen to me? And so after a few hours of shock, it wears off, you know, some support from my friends and family. I learned a lesson that day that would carry with me for the rest of my life. And that is nobody is going to look out for my financial well-being, but me. 
And that taught me a valuable lesson. Mm-hmm. You can be as loyal as you want to a company, work as many hours as you want, work as hard as you want. But at the end of the day, that company has to do whatever's best for them. And so that set me on my road towards entrepreneurship and starting my own business. And now I'm on a mission to help other people, you know, achieve financial freedom and get out of the rat race. Mm-hmm. Nice. What I tell you what, that was, I, I knew it had to be a shocker when it first happened. I, when I first started working years ago, I was a government contractor and mm-hmm. this was back in the eighties when they, they, a lot of people, the belt, we call them beltway bandits. The contractors, everybody was just, man, just living off the government dole. And I was right out of college. I had no clue what was going on. They just called our entire office and one day, 130 people. And they said, well, our, our contracts just, just been uh, canceled. And, you know, we, we were, we're, we're all technically out of work. Yeah, wow. in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, okay, great. What's this going to be like? What two weeks later? You know, a month? We got it, and they're like, no, right now. <laughs> like, holy crap! And guess what? I was doing a week later, man. I was getting married. You know, so any case, huh. uh, you know, quite a shocker. But but just like you, it really taught me a, hard, a really strong. And th- I got a new job right away. I mean, I had a computer science degree. It was it was almost a no-brainer. But but the thing is, is I started investing right away. There was the stock market. And I, as I thought to myself, you know, um, I'm looking around, looking at all these people that at the time I was, you know, 22, 23 years old. And some of these guys were like in their 60s. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking, I do not want to be caught cold when I'm, I, mean, I want to be retired, you know. Yeah. So in any case, uh, that's when I started taking, I started investing right away. And I'm so grateful for that experience because on my family, my mom would say, well, why do you want to save for this 401k thing right now? You're only 22 years old. You got plenty of time. You know, that was what I was getting. So in any case, so back back to you, though, um, I really appreciate you sharing that because everybody listening, you know, you can learn life from your own experiences and it could be all pleasant or you can mm-hmm. have a mixture of good and bad or you can learn from others. And this is one of those opportunities, you know, learn from Brandon, learn from me. The best time to invest, start investing is yesterday. <laughs> I could be any planner. Just you haven't started. You need to start now. Let's let's go back to where you are now and uh, and take us from there, you know? Yeah. So, you know, we I started, to, that's what kind of catapulted this whole real estate journey, kind of where we're at now. So fast forward, we started out, you know, just flipping houses, sort of graduated, started doing some new construction opportunities, and then started with what we're doing today, which is adding value to the local municipalities that we work with. So today, everything starts with identifying the vision for the community that you're working with and helping that vision become a reality. So what does that look like? We go and we will sit down with the local planning commissions. And this is mostly in the suburbs, right? Just to paint a picture, it's much more difficult to go to like, if you're in like New York city and just go and, you know, sit down and have a meeting with the, with New York, like this is mostly in the suburbs and it's mostly in the suburbs and not the downtown core because that's where a lot of the affordable entry level first time home buyer housing is. So we go and these planning commissions and uh, you know sometimes the mayors are more than happy to sit down with us and show us hey, here's what we want to create. Here's what's lacking in the community. Here's what all the community members are complaining about. And then as a developer, we get to go in and reverse engineer that vision and make it a reality. And so for us that's identifying the parcels of land that are not the highest and best use and then our team goes in and we will contract for those parcels of land to basically say, hey, we will give you this much money for it if we can achieve this result. And that's usually taking a piece of land from you know, like agricultural or, you know, like residential and taking it from a few houses to, you know, 50, 100, you know, 200 plus homes. And so that does a couple things. Number one is all of a sudden it force appreciates the value of the land before we buy it. And so that's one of the things that's really mm-hmm. crucial is we're not buying these parcels of land until after that value has been created and we've insulated mm-hmm. ourselves. And so that usually takes some time to do. And so that's kind of exit strategy number one that we've got. We've got three three different exit strategies. Once we've done that, okay. we've built in the money, we can then acquire that land with our investor base and we can land bank it, we can hang on to it, we can flip it to another developer, or we can go exit strategy number two, which is we actually... Okay 
develop the land, putting in the roads, the infrastructure, everything, getting it built ready. And then we can sell that to another builder. And this isn't just single family, mind you. We can do this with commercial, industrial, et cetera. Sky's the limit. Those single families are bread and butter. We do more of that than any other asset class in real estate. And so having that in bit builder, having them contracted is cru crucial because we've already got an exit strategy planned up. So that's that's exit strategy number two. Exit strategy number three is we can actually build and sell the houses ourselves. And so we're okay. also working on an exit strategy number four, which is to actually rent and hold the assets. Uh, you know, BlackRock, Blackstone kind of popularized this idea of like build to rent. We also want to do that. So what I really love about this strategy that we've got going on is one, we're focused on a great asset class where there's very, very low supply and very, very high demand. That's entry level housing. And we've got three different for sure exit strategies that we can do. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you what, um, as you're talking through this, I'm thinking back to some other folks that I've known over the years and some of my own experiences. And um, I'm gathering you've gotten pretty good at it. At, at, I call I call it team building. In other words, you know, you've you've looked for talent and you want to find it's, it's part of its chemistry. You want to be able to get along with each other. Part of its talent with the, with their experience level is, but there's always that the the things that you really they're hard to document, like like a person's level of ambition, you know what where where if they're what type of character are they that type of thing. So can you can you dive in a little bit about you know how do you find your A plus rock stars? How what's is there a a Brandon Cobb secret formula that you use <laughs> that <laughs> seems to work? You know. Yeah. So th there is a process. And if you don't have a hiring process, you want to have some kind of hiring process. And so I'll kind of you know, briefly go through it. And hopefully this can save you some money and a lot of headache because, man, I've hired the wrong people before. I had one guy that we hired and I mean, people can almost rob your company blind. And, you know, I've had that happen mm -hmm. to us. Um, what we do is it all starts with identifying really what you're going after. Okay, so if you don't know what fish you're going to go try to fish for, you're not going to catch that fish. You don't want to just throw some bait in the water and hope that something pops up. So having a clear idea of who you're going for is step one. What does that look like? Core values and the skill sets that you need. Core values and the skill sets you need. Why core values? Because you want somebody who's in the organization that aligns with your belief system, with who you are. You don't want there to be any friction because you can have a bunch of great team members that are all skilled, but if they don't work well together, you're not going to have a well-oiled machine. And so, for example, we start out with, uh, you know, phone interviews. It's very, very brief. We have our assistant go through and filter for experience. We use WiseHire. WiseHire is awesome. They submit the res, uh, they get resumes in from like Monster and Indeed.com and all these other different platforms out there. They do all the work for you. And then they Throw them all into this nice, clean funnel that you can move candidates through. It's really, really awesome. So after the assistant screens for new hires, they'll set up phone calls. And there's a couple of questions we ask because you don't want to waste your time or theirs. And so on that phone call, you're filtering for a few things. Number one is first question that I ask is, what stood out most to you about our company? And I asked this for one reason. Did they prepare for the phone call? And if they don't have anything, bye, see you later. They didn't take the time to prepare. I already know they're a fit. I didn't waste my time with you know three, four, five hours of interviews afterwards. That's question number one. Question number two is, what do you want to get out of this long term? They've got a clear vision that tells you that they're growth oriented. They're looking for someone to grow. They don't have a good answer to that. They're just looking for the next opportunity. Um, then pay expectations. You'd be surprised by how many people don't read what the pay is on there. And I've had a guy that I went, through four or five hours of interviews with to find out that we were way off on what he wanted and what we were offering. And I was like, mm -hmm. we could have just saved ourselves a bunch of time and got that out up front. Uh, and then I make sure I yeah. leave time at the end for them to ask questions. If they don't ask questions, that's a big problem. It means that they're just not genuinely interested and they haven't prepared. So that's, that's the phone call. The next step, if we like them, I use what's called Loom. Loom is an awesome app that allows you to quickly record and send videos because I don't want to take the time to have to type everything out on email. In this Loom video, I'm asking them a series of questions to basically filter their core values and get to know their personality a little bit better. 
you want to make sure that mm-hmm. you would like to go out and have dinner with this person or maybe chug a beer. They call it like the beer chug test. I don't know why it's like chug a beer, but you want to be able to go out and hang out with this person and seeing them send mm-hmm. a loom video back to you. You get to see them feel their personality and sell the answer. Now, this is where the core values come into play. We filter for those first. So, for example, you know, some of our core values is growth, humility, integrity, extreme ownership, and ambitiousness. And so if I'm filtering for that growth core value, what I ask is, tell me the last three or four books or podcasts that you've listened to and what you learned from it. Mm-hmm. And if they say, well, I just don't read books or podcasts, that kind of tells me they probably don't have that core value, Right. Right. Extreme ownership, for example. We want people that will own a problem, not point fingers when things go wrong. We ask them, hey, tell me the last time you were working in a team environment and you didn't accomplish your goal. Whose fault was it and why? And we're looking for how they take ownership or if they point blame or not. So those are just a few examples of how we ask questions to filter out the core values. Now, at that point, if past that, it's time for an in-person interview. And I'm going to give you a secret here that blows away the in-person interviews. The key here is you want to remove the wall. There is a facade, a professional facade that people bring to the interview process that you got to get rid of because you want to get to know them personally. And so you don't want to ask questions that elicit canned responses like, tell me about your greatest weakness or tell me about your greatest strengths. They've got something memorized for that. It's called behavioral style interviewing. And what you do is you come with a list of skills that you want to filter for and you ask them to tell stories that that exhibit those skill sets. And you do this because people can BS answers. They can't BS stories. It is much more difficult Mm -hmm. for the mind to create and fabricate an entire story around a particular skill set they've done than it is to just say, I did this thing one time and that's the skill set. So what does this look like? For example, I'm hiring a sales rep. I know that Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to influence people. So I would ask the question, tell me a story of about a time you got a customer to start talking about their problems and you were successfully able to get them to purchase your product. How did you do it? I'm hiring a project manager for our development. I might ask, tell me about a time you were required to fire and replace a subcontractor. Why and how did you do it? Again, because I'm after a certain skill set and I'm asking them to tell a story about a time that elicited that skill. So that's that's the, the third stage right there. The fourth is if they okay. pass that, now you're really on the money. But at this point, you want to do what's called an on-site job interview. And so if it's a sales rep, you're getting in the car, you're coming on some appointments. If it's like a project manager role, you're getting in the car, we're going to go walk some projects. And I want to quiz them on the job and see how they would handle certain things. And I'm looking for one thing right here. Can they do this job better than my best guy there? Or, you know, if it's something that I'm particularly doing and I'm replacing myself, can they do it better than me? So if this Mm -hmm. person, and this is really critical, if they can't come into the organization and do a better job and make the department better than what it already is, you don't hire them. This is hiring top down, not bottom. You want to hire rock stars. And so we only bring people in the organization that if we don't learn something about improving our current systems and processes during the interview process, we do not hire that person. And you find most of that out on the job site interview. Now, if they pass that afterwards, what you'll then do is you'll do an actual mock work day where you actually pay them to come in. If it's, you know, they already got a job, make it a weekend day or whatever. And you want to work with this person for an entire day. And you want your team to work with them as well and fill this person out. Mm -hmm. If that goes well, then you can move on to the drug, uh, the drug test, and the background yeah. test. Hire them. That is our whole process boiled down into a nutshell. Did you know that you can participate in class every Monday? We call it Monday Night Live, seven PM Eastern, with me and dozens of other investor agents from around the country. In fact, the world. Every Monday, totally free. No selling, no recruiting, just straight up education on anything and everything in real estate. And we have a lot of good guests coming up once or twice a month bringing an expertise on subjects like how to buy a house with crypto. Okay. How about them apples? What what about AI? How's AI affecting our business? How about the metaverse? Blockchain processing. We're already using it in title work. So so come on to Monday Night Live. Be ready to take notes and ask questions because it's live and engaging 
and you get to participate by asking questions and meeting others. So we'll see you there. Uh, go to Gary Real Estate with Gary Wilson.com, click on the resource tab, drop down, and you'll see Monday Night Live. And in there, you can see one of the most recent classes. But more importantly, you can register for class as many as you want going up to like the end of the year, I believe. So in any case, uh, do that. We'll see you on Monday Night Live. Look forward to meeting you in person. Take care. That's awesome. Extremely thorough. It's also, you know, professional, but it's also it's also respectful to the person. I mean, it, you know, people who the kind of people you want to attract, you know, really talented, you know, rock A plus rock star people, they're going to expect that type of due diligence, the thorough due diligence on bringing somebody because it really is it's extremely important. I mean, it's it, it'll make or break your business, like you said, and you know, it's almost like, you know. Legally speaking, it's it's as strict as, as getting married. I mean, you're like you bring that person on, man. There's all kinds of laws that kick in. People don't realize sometimes if you yeah. have to let somebody go, you better know those laws before you even hire somebody. <laughs> because you may come across that situation where you've got to, I've had to do that too, and it's, it's not fun. But it, I don't want to sound callous to people, but I've I've done it enough times over the last you know forty years. You know, in banking, I learned a lot. What I learned from banking was is how to do that process. But more, yeah. but just as importantly, when it's time to go, how to make that happen again, professionally, respectfully, but also, you know, if, if you can't fool around, I tell you, a, a bad apple can ruin the whole bunch. And I've seen it happen. I've had it happen to me, one of my businesses. And, um, you know, I'm totally responsible. So I, I brought the person in, you know, 14 years later is when things unraveled. It uh, it was just a you know simple character flaw that you know just didn't didn't reveal itself till later. But in any case, back to this. I'm gathering you're pretty good with your systems and processes. <laughs> so uh, I know we're gonna probably you know we we can keep going for for a day if we wanted to or a week. But talk about um, any other vital systems and processes when it comes to building a business. The hiring is actually that's that's like screening tenants in a rental property. That's where the game is won. You know we're lost. But can you at least mention some of the other systems and processes when it comes to to business building, you know, building a business itself? Yeah, I mean, guy, you could just you could do like a week long podcast on just this thing right here. So we adopted mm -hmm. a model called EOS, which is the Entrepreneur Operating System, and we've kind of simplified it. We really like this operating system because it makes the business owner feel like they're in control and they're running the business and not vice versa on them. So one of the processes mm -hmm. that we use is everybody needs to, one, clearly know what their role is, because if you haven't outlined all the their duties and responsibilities, stuff falls through the cracks and problems mm -hmm. happen. I'll give you an example. We... You know, we had a pretty big miscommunication years ago with who was ultimately responsible for the budget. And I know that that sounds crazy because it's such a big deal, but there are so many different parties involved in the budget. Head of construction, project manager, there's the architect that's involved, there's the civil engineer, then there's the owner. And all of a sudden we were in a situation where it was like, we're over budget and we couldn't identify like whose fault it was. And ultimately, it was my fault as the owner because I didn't properly delegate and say, hey, look, this is the box. This is your box. These are the responsibilities that you need. So having very clearly outlined duties and responsibilities per role, and then more importantly, creating accountability around that. So just because you give somebody a task, you've got to be able to measure their performance in that task. And so we do this via weekly KPIs or weekly key performance indicators. But what does this look like? Yeah. We use a simple Excel sheet. And we want to track the leading indicators that produce the lagging indicators that we want. What does lagging indicators mean? Well, I'm after a specific result. If I want to build a house during a certain amount of time, spend a certain amount of money on it, or maybe I want to make uh, X number of sales and I'm looking at the sales rep, I know that we need to be tracking how many, uh, how many contracts is he putting in for a week? How many appointments is he going on? You know, how many calls is this sales rep making? We want to be able to reverse engineer success. And so every week when we can look at their key performance indicator sheet and see how many calls they're making, how many contracts they're getting, how the funnel's moving, we can then track and measure that position. We've got a grip on it and we can see if they're doing their job versus not doing their job. And this is, it gives us a very clear indication of whether or not to reward this person 
or let this person go. So you want to make sure that you're measuring each position with key performance indicators because your rock stars, yeah. they want to be rewarded. They want to be measured. Next yes. is having, yeah. having a clear vision. Many people don't know where they're going in business. They just want to make a lot of money. And I argue that that's probably why they haven't. When you get into the business of making money, you have problems. If you want to solve problems, you will make money. So get in the business of solving problems and not getting in the business of making money. Have a clear vision of yeah. where you're going and then make sure you're reversing that down. And if you're not sure because everything's kind of crazy, you should at least have like where you want to be at the end of the year. Well, if you know where you want to be at the end of the year, think of each quarter as a stepping stone to get there. So you've got like four steps and start with the first step. What do we need to do it as an organization this quarter to move the needle with our annual goals? And so we call these quarterly rocks. The U.S. calls it quarterly rocks. And so these are goals that are set up per department that need to be hit. Sales might need to have a certain goal made. Maybe the finance department has to raise a certain amount of capital. So these are the big rocks that you need to hit that quarterly goal. Next is people don't just want to work for an organization and just work for money. They want to feel like they're making a contribution these days, right? You know, everybody wants to feel when they buy that product that, you know, some kid in Africa is getting taken care of and has water or they purchase something and a, and a puppy gets saved, right? We have this need to contribute and make more than just money. We want to make an impact. So having what Jim Collins really popularized, this big, hairy, audacious goal is super important. And for us, that's ending veteran homelessness here in Middle Tennessee. And so what we do with our communities, when we were sitting down with our team and trying to figure out like, what do we want to do with our business that make an impact even more so with what we're doing with local community, but like in a big way, my partner, he's a, he's a veteran. And so we kind of harped on this concept that like the people who gave the most are people that protect you in our opinion. Like those are the people that just do yeah. not get rewarded as much as they should have 100%. And so we sought out to work with organizations that are aligned to help in veteran homelessness. And, you know, our yeah. goal when we invent these new communities, like we want to give away at least one home in each new community to a homeless vet, someone who's kind of proven themselves. There's, there's these great organizations out there that provide housing mm -hmm. for homeless men specifically. And a lot of homeless men just happen to be veterans as well. They're uh, their conditions because of war and PTSD, et cetera, have kind of created this, this homelessness position. And for those that integrate well into their program, they, you know, for a year have stayed off drugs, they've obeyed curfew, they've gotten a job, they've, you know, saved money, they've taken advantage of these, uh, these charities um, they're, they're giving and they've kind of like proven themselves and they're like ready to take the next step and integrate back into society. We want to donate to those guys. We want to, uh, you know, maybe pay their apartment year rent or, you know, help them out, maybe even offer them a job with the construction company, something to help the funnel of homeless vets back into the community. So that's our big, hairy, audacious goal. And yeah, those are some of the things that if you implement in your organization as well, I promise you, you will see some success with. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I'm really um, impressed and, and, and honored that I have you on and, and that you have that vision for, for homeless veterans. So um, now, just so I have the clarity, Mike, because I want to try to help you out with this. And I'm sure a lot of the listeners too feel the same way. Um, is, is this something you're developing yourself or is this, I think you mentioned you're, you're looking for organizations that are already involved in that space and you're looking to play a role in that effort to place homeless veterans. And, and you gave the example of being able to give away one home, you know, you know I can't remember if it was per year or per neighborhood, that type of thing. But is this something that's sort of a, either is or going to be uh, an official organization like a 5013C, or is it more about you just tapping into the existing organizations and, and taking what you have, your resources, and making those available to those other organizations? I probably taken way too long to ask that question, but yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. it's, it's two parts, right? And so really there's, yeah. you know, we're not creating like an official charity or anything like that. And the reason is there's people out mm -hmm. there that have, they've already systemized that they've already created the funnel and we just want to supplement it. So part one 
is aligning ourselves with those charities. Like they like, like, for example, there's a local charity here called Matthew 25 that we really, you know, like for some of these upcoming uh, developments, we are excited to be able to donate a big portion of the profits to be able to help them out because they're already identifying all of the homeless men. A large portion happen to be homeless veterans and giving them free housing, giving them free food, giving them jobs, right? Drug testing them, trying to get them, uh, you know, a place that they're like that next step away from homelessness and trying to integrate them back into society. So for the men that prove themselves in that organization, if we can come in and say, hey, look, here's uh, $15,000, we'll pay for a full year of an apartment out of this charity. So they're kind of, they're integrated, right? It, well, it gives them a leg up. So well, that's part one is working with those types of organizations. And again, locally here in middle Tennessee is where we're focused currently. Not to say that that footprint won't expand in the yeah. future. The second part is, you know, our goal and like, like we really want to make like a big, big splash is trying mm -hmm. to get to where we can give away a home in these larger communities that we invent. Right. And like, this is like the big, you know, aha, uh -huh, you know, it could be a family that like mm -hmm. lost a homeless veteran um, or, you know, mm -hmm. again, one that's worked in this organization, these charities, and has kind of proven themselves. And so we want to be able to, in the business of not just making money and, and helping the community and helping the neighbors yeah. around us, uh, you know, helping the sellers who sell us their land, you know, helping the investors we work with that make money, but also impacting veterans homelessness in a big way. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And you, you really covered a lot of me. My gosh, you went through, you know, the hiring, pro your hiring process, you went through, you know, systems of processes for actually building a business and all of that leads to success. And clearly you've been successful. I mean, you've got, you know, four, four extra strategies when it comes to dealing with real estate and investing in real estate. You can either take the land, you, like you said, bake bake the land and then eventually sell the land. You can develop the land. That's number two. And that's a whole discussion in and of itself. I mean, you know, to talk about hiring and, and processes and procedures, I'm sure, you know, that there's, there's a lot there. You're dealing with municipalities and utilities and everything that goes, the roads, everything that goes into development. The third strategy was actually building. You, so you develop, you get the land, one, you develop the land, two. Now you can actually be the builder and build on the land. And that's the, that strategy exists a lot, too. Some people just like to develop. Some people just like to build. But some people can do all of that. And then the, the fourth way is to actually hold and rent the properties, which is vitally important because the way this, the way our country is going and the way the economy is evolving, you know, I, I don't want, I don't want to go into a lot of politics and economics. I'm not an expert either. I just, I just am a realist. I see what's happening. And yeah. if you think about it, Brandon, when was the last time you and I heard on any newscast, any politician anywhere say we're really pushing for home ownership. It hasn't happened in a generation. Everything yeah. is geared towards, you know, you know, of, of affordable housing, which we desperately need in this country right now. We're about seven million units short, and most of it's in the affordable housing sector. You guys are addressing it, which is phenomenal because you're the first person I met that's actually addressing it. But, but in any case, the and back to the policy, you you know. There's a lot to be said for the philosophy of, you know, going when you're in a river, you paddle downstream, you go with the flow, you know, are there problems to solve? Absolutely. I'm not saying we need to ignore homelessness. We don't, we need to address it. I, in my family, my son and one of my brothers worked directly in two different organizations for, for addressing homeless men, actually, by the way. Um, but affordability that, that, you know, we, we need, I'm not a big proponent of big government, any stretch of the imagination. But one of the things the government could do is help to foster policy that, that leans towards home ownership. Okay. And it needs to be affordable home ownership right now. And most builders, they, they only want to build the million dollar homes because there's more profit there. So we have a big void there. We don't see the policy coming out. You guys are actually addressing it at the grassroots level. And I hope everybody's listening to this because maybe you can inspire your local builder to do the same thing. There's opportunity there. I mean, my gosh, I know builders that build, and they do keep, and when the economy goes down, they keep a percentage of their inventory to hold to rent out while the economy is going. They're smart, right? Third mm -hmm. generation builders. It actually, it's called 3G builders. And they do that because they have experience that tells them, go with the flow. When you do, the answer presents itself as far as how you can address these 
these deficiencies in, in our economies and in our governing bodies. You know, again, if you're in the government, please forgive me. I'm not trying to knock you. It's not you. It's not it's not the boots. It's the suits. You know, and I'll, I will say one thing. People at Washington, I just don't there's no way they could be com- connected to what's happening out in the communities. They're, it shows in their policy. They're not connected. It's up to us. And that's what this country has always been about us. It's not about what the government can do for us. It's what we can do as Americans to keep this country going strong. You know, so uh, you guys are right at the forefront, man. I can't emphasize that enough. But I want to, I want to give, a, I want to give a couple plugs here. Um, we didn't even get into like the, the building, the building part, the components there, or anything like that at all. But yeah, I understand you have um, uh, a website h hbgcapital.net. And uh, so, so who who would go visit that site, and what would what should they be looking for? Uh, what can they what can they get there, or can they communicate with someone there? You know. Yeah, if you're somebody who's interested in diversifying, you know, away from the stock market or or whatever, and in learning more about real estate and how to create passive income from real estate, I'm talking about truly hands off, right? You know. A lot of people think mm-hmm. single family rentals are hands off until you become a landlord and you're like, holy crap. But if you're somebody who's interested in building a legacy, if you're trying to impact those around you and ultimately retire, like actually retire, uh, there's a ton of free resources on our website. We happen to work with a ton of business owners, but you know we don't just work with business owners. There's other people that reach out as well. Uh, but on our website, we've got a free ebook, 100 Questions Business Owners Ask Before Investing. And again, it works for anybody, nice. um, not just business owners, but you can grab that ebook on our website. I wrote that ebook because I got a call from one of our investors one day asking if I would help out a buddy who lost all of his money in a real estate investment with somebody who was apparently Ooh. trusted. It was a deal out in California, uh, and it became very evident early on in this call that this gentleman was just very green. He didn't structure anything right. The, there was no securitization. The um, thing was was used for something other uh, completely else. And this this guy just stopped answering his phone calls. And he was wanting to know what his net, what his options were. And really, at that point, it's just you know lawsuits and good luck getting your money back. But I left that call going, if I could just prevent this from happening to one other person, you know, how would I do that? Mm-hmm. And questions give you the keys to unlock the answers that you need. Had this guy been armed with the right questions, he did not know to ask. I'm confident he would not have been in the same predicament. So I wrote that ebook to give people the key they need to get the questions, the answers that they need to prevent a bad investment. So yeah, you can go on our website, hbgcapital.net. There's a ton of other stuff. You can go check out our podcast, Recession Resistant Real Estate Radio. There's a ton of great stuff on there too. Excellent. So H- hbgcapital.net, guys. And the the book you can get is 100 Questions Business Owners Ask Before Investing. Brilliant. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and finally, the uh, Recession Resistant Real Estate Radio, which I've had the great pleasure of being on. So I highly endorse it. <laughs> um, so, Brandon, I, I got to tell you, man, I know we went a tiny bit long, but this has been a, a phenomenal podcast. And I hope everybody... Listen again, guys. If you've been driving, you know, don't worry. Come, come home. You can see everything on the show notes. If you weren't driving, hope you were taking notes and so reach out, reach out to Brandon. And that Nashville has been one of the fastest growing markets in the entire country. It's an awesome place to go and have fun. Wonderful people. There's a river running right through town, and there's music everywhere. It's just a beautiful place. Tennessee, the state of Tennessee is actually outgrowing every other state right now on a per capita <laughs> basis. Even Florida, people don't realize uh-huh. that. You've got these these awesome little towns like Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg that people only heard of on Hee Haw, the show back <laughs> in the in the yeah. 70s and 80s. You've, you wouldn't recognize it now, guys. I mean, it's just amazing, you know. And on the eastern part of the state, you got the beautiful Smoky Mountains. I mean, just an amazing place. Go visit it, and you might find yourself wanting to stay there or invest there. And uh, I would check out Brandon if you if you do that. So, Brandon, any any final word? I always like to ask this question. Um, anything you can think of when you were a child, you heard from like your granddad or your grandma, something that was like a one liner that stuck with you and has become part of your 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 life's philosophy. You know, man, could, you be, know, any, could be a parent. You don't have to. My, gra- my grandfather, my grandfather. 
my grandfather, he passed away like five, six years ago, but I remember him driving me around in, uh, in college freshman year and he was taking me shopping to get like a car. And he's, he, this, this guy had owned motels in Florida on the beach. He'd open up restaurants. He'd started multiple businesses. He was definitely an entrepreneur, natural entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And he said, Brandon, let me, let me tell you something. If a man tells you he does something and he does it, well, he's worth something. Well, if, and if a man tells you he's going to do something and he doesn't, well, Brandon, he ain't worth crap. <laughs> and I so it. I took that as, you know, if people show you their true colors, pay attention to that early on. Don't don't give them any second chances. You got only one opportunity to make a good first impression when you're doing business with people. And so that first impression is a good indication of how that relationship is going to continue to go. And that served me really well. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome advice. And I appreciate you sharing. And uh, and thank, thank you again, Brandon, for being on. And thank you, everybody listening. If you could please remember, check out, check out Brandon's podcast, okay? Recession Resistant Real Estate Radio. And while you're online, leave a review. Leave a review for one of Brandon's podcasts and leave a review for this one. We, Your reviews are really important to us. I know you, a lot of times you don't realize that, but you know we don't get paid for this. This is a community service. Indirectly, yes, we, we attract people and we build relationships, but essentially it's a community service. So your reviews are our currency. That's how we keep it going, right? So leave a review. We certainly appreciate it. And uh, Brandon, I look forward to crossing paths again, man. It's been a wonderful journey so far. And I look forward to working with you, brother. You know? Hey, you too. Thanks, Gary. You got it. Okay, everyone, take care of yourselves. God bless you and your families. And we will see you on the next Massive Passive Cashflow Podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of Massive Passive Cashflow. Be sure to go to realestatewithgarywilson.com to join our community and start building wealth today.